Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and uh, we are here today with two Australia, best-selling Australian writers. Um, first of all, Sulari Gentil has a brand new book called Shanghai Secrets, just out from the Poison Pen Press. And um, Emma Viskich has a brand new book here called Darkness for Light. And uh, we, what was it last year or before the whole pandemic, right before we had a, a group of four of you, right? Australian authors. That was so much fun. Yeah, we, uh, we just got in before all our borders closed. Uh, I think it was exactly. a matter of a couple of months, really. Yeah. It was November of 2019. Patrick, I am not seeing that we're on Facebook. I'm seeing we're only on custom live streaming service. Do you need to restart this? Uh, no, it'll take it a second for it to come up. I started it on Facebook. Okay, well, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, Barbara is at her home library there, and I'm going to be, as usual, monitoring the Facebook uh, comments field. So if you have questions for our authors, go ahead and send them in, and I will pop up whenever whenever I'm cued. So Barbara, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Patrick. It's lovely to see you both. You know, it was so much fun. Uh, it was after the Dallas Boucher Con when you all had a grant from Australia, which I thought was really impressive for travel funds. And you came to see us. Who are we missing from that group? Two guys and another woman. Yeah. No, no Jock Sarong. Yeah, Jock Sarong and Robert Gott. Yeah. Okay. There wasn't, that was it. There wasn't any other woman. Okay, all right. For some reason, I keep thinking Drifla McTurnan was part of that. Oh, oh no. no. But Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but she was about Chacon. Um, so, um, and funnily enough, because although she lives in Australia, um, I don't think any of us had actually managed to meet her before about Chacon. Um, and so Dervla actually uh, hosted our panel at, at about Chacon. So it was a, a it was a, a meeting and a, and a sort of reunion at the same time, because we've all chatted online, of course, but um, it's a very wide country, Australia, and she lives all the way over into the West. And we're all over on the East Coast. So it's just, we've, we've never managed to meet up before. Uh, didn't we include her in an event we did? We did a conversation. I thought I remembered negotiating oh, all that. We did an online Zoom. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's, uh, the four of us did it. And that's when I'm, that's why I'm confused thinking she was actually oh. physically at the Poison Pen. But the other thing I remember about your visit to the Poison Pen is in a moment of insanity, you decided to zip in a trip up to the Grand Canyon, which <laughs> was like an overnight. And I mean, we were all aghast because it's so far. Well, well, it no, was not it was a nature. A moment. <laughs> it was. It was more a. It was more a, a moment of extreme generosity by a couple of Americans who were at the poison pen that night, who overheard us bemoaning the fact that we were in Arizona and wouldn't see the Grand Canyon, um, and they picked us up at what was it seven thirty in the morning and drove us up there and back. Um, if we tried to go ourselves, we'd still be lost somewhere in Sedona, I think. Right, so you must have seen it from the South Rim, uh, which is beautiful. If you ever have more time, it's a huge drive because you obviously can't leap over the canyon. You have to drive all the way around it. But the North Rim is spectacular. So I haven't given up hope that you'll both be back to see us at some point. Meantime, let me ask you, is the flooding affecting either one of you? I see that Australia is lurching from drought to flood. Um, I'm in New South Wales. I don't know about Victoria. We're very, very wet. Uh, but I actually live in the mountains, so if the mountains were flooded, the rest of the state would be underwater. Um, so we're just sort of holding uh, our heads above the, the saturation at the moment. Uh, but Victoria's starting to flood too, isn't it? Yeah, but nothing like New South Wales. I mean, we're, we're, um, we're on alert, but it's okay here. But there's a famous Australian poem by Dorothy McKellar, um, Australia, a land of drought and flooding rains. Um, so it's always been a, a land of contrast, but it's it's obviously much worse now with uh, the climate crisis. Um, yeah. and, and New South Wales has really had it hard, I think. I mean, Victoria had very bad bushfires as well last year, but New South Wales is is copying it. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting thing. Uh, this bushfires are more immediately frightening, but floods do more damage because they take your topsoil, they take your fences, they take your bridges, um, and they just sort of use that as a battering ram um, as the waters progress further. So it, it, often the cleanup for a flood is much worse than the, the cleanup for a fire, even the big bushfires. 
So, so Larry, when you're writing the Roland Sinclair series set in the 1930s, which, as you know, is one of my favorite series, and we've been doing this together forever. Um, in fact, this is book nine, the one we're talking about today, Shanghai Secrets. Have you, do you include a weather crisis? Were, was there a notable weather crisis? I remember the one book where, you know, it was kind of like an American Western where you were out there on a, uh, yeah. on a station would have been a chance for it. Otherwise, you're not always in Australia, you're in Sydney and so forth. But what would you do? Uh, look, I, I would, it's, it's really interesting. I was speaking to some of the old timers in the, in the RFS shed, which is our volunteer fire brigade. So in Australia, bushfires are handled completely by volunteers. Um, and so the Batlow Bushfire Brigade, and Batlow's where I live, has an average age of about 75. Um, so you can talk to uh, some of the old guys in the shed and they can tell you how they used to fight fires with wet brooms. <laughs> um, and uh, and, and I, I find that really intriguing. I'm looking for a chance to write it. But as you know, I'm, I'm particular, I don't like to stay too, straight too far from history um so i'm waiting for the bushfires to actually come up uh in the 1930s there was big bushfires in 1932 which were mentioned in book one uh but they come up again at the end um when just past america's going through a dust bowl in 1935 1936 i think australia hits the fires shortly thereafter so they will come up um, I mean, the, the thing is that disasters are, are similar in, in the sense that, you know, whether you're in 1930 or you're in 2020, you're, you're facing massive loss, but not just individual loss, but community loss. Mm -hmm. um, so there's that, that notion of maybe there won't be a town to rebuild because everything could be gone. And I'd really love to explore that in a novel. Um, and have a look at that in terms of individual peril, which, you know, Roland goes through individual peril all the time. But when you're looking at a disaster, it's, it's that, that existential uh, sense of peril where everything could be gone. And in some ways that coincides with the way he feels about the rising threat of the Nazis, that it is an existential threat to to way of life across the planet, which is probably why that that uh, rings with such urgency for him. Uh, but I think, yeah. But I, but I, I would really like to to write it now that I've lived it. <laughs> but uh, I've just got to wait for history to give me that opportunity. Well, you often refer to the Sinclair's family as pastoralists, which is not a term that Americans would normally use. But presumably, it means that they have um, a st agricultural properties where they're raising yeah, what cattle, sheep. Ranches. Yeah, ranches. So th this pastoralists quite often are sheep people, uh, as opposed to cattle. But they can be a, a mixed stock, um, and quite often in Australia you have mixed farms, especially in this region where they do grow some something. Um, they have cattle and they have sheep, and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and diversify. So pastoralist sort of covers that area. So in, in Australia, there was a difference between a farmer and a pastoralist. To be a pastoralist, uh, you had to be significantly wealthy and have a significant property. There weren't any poor pastoralists. Well, I brought it up because, you know, people are always asking her. Frequently we hear um, that people want Brit speak translated to American, which is ridiculous. Um, but I think that there are certainly Australian terms that are not familiar, and I wouldn't like to see them translated. So it's a good idea to explain them. So Emma, before we go off to Shanghai, Darkness for Light is what? Is this your fourth book for Caleb? It's the third Caleb book. I'm currently writing the fourth one. Um, um, yeah, so it, it, somewhere in, in, in the scheme of the, um, the series, I, I wasn't quite, I knew it was going to be a short series and I wasn't quite sure where I was going to end. I mean, actually now I'm thinking it's going to be a series of short series with a jump in time. But so um, Darkness for Light came about um, when I was writing the second book and fire came down. Um, and I knew that I wanted to go into Caleb's um, story a little bit more with his business partner, Frankie, uh, who I won't talk to about too much because I, I give away many, many plot points once I start on Frankie's uh, backstory. 
but um, she was very much a character I I wanted to spend more time with. She's a you know she's in her late fifties. She's got a rough past. She's very gruff, um, and I love the way she balances out Caleb. Um, because Caleb needs a bit of smacking down by the women in his life occasionally, um, and she uh, she definitely does <laughs> does that. So um, yeah, darkness for light very much came about by wanting to play around with their relationship a, a little bit. I know we talked about this before for the benefit of people who haven't yet heard your um, heard you speak about it. Why did you decide to make your private eye, Caleb, um, deaf? <laughs> So the, the short story is I didn't. <laughs> uh, it's a, he came from uh, what I call my murky subconscious. Mm. Um, really, it's only in retrospect I've understood why I made him deaf, which is uh, it, it came from a, a very obvious place, which was I went to school with a deaf girl when I was quite young, you know, 9, 10, when you're starting to, to um, really be interested in other people's lives and how people are different and they have different experiences. Um, but the bigger story is that um, his character has always been there in some form or other ever since I was a child because of my relationship with my grandparents. And I only had grandparents on my father's side and they didn't speak English. They were Croatian uh, immigrants. And as was very normal at the time, I was not raised to speak Croatian. So we couldn't communicate at all. Um, and so it was that sort of frustration with the communication and, and also seeing um, how isolated they were uh, in their own lives. They were very happy if they were in this tight community, Slav community, but going out into the wider world um, was very difficult. So I can see little seeds of his character through, you know, all my childhood writing from uh, a man who's blind, a girl who's mute, you know, someone who's invisible, and it's just sort of been there the whole time and then of course it takes me to write a whole book to suddenly go oh that's what I'm writing about <laughs> so it definitely wasn't conscious to begin with but that, that's that's where the seeds uh, of his character came from is there a significant Croatian immigrant population in Australia Australia like the U.S. has had some pretty tense immigration moments and policies I mean Sulari writes about them back in the 30s when they were really ugly um, yeah, yeah the, the, it, it's a small but significant portion. Uh, it's more in New South Wales than Victoria. Um, so we had uh, what was called a white Australia policy. Uh, that was our official government policy um, up until the 50s. It was very much um, English, Irish, Scottish immigrants. Um, no one else was uh, allowed in. And then there was a big discussion about whether uh, the, the, the rude slang word, which is now owned by us, whether wogs would be allowed in, which is people from Croatia, Italy, Greece, um, whether they counted as white. Uh, so in the 50s, uh, the government decided that they would be counted as white. Mm -hmm. And then the government changed um, and then that's when we started getting much bigger immigration from the from the rest of the world from Asia and Africa and everywhere so it's it's been a it's been quite a journey um, culturally the, the white Australia, sorry the, the white Australia policy was in force in Australia till the 70s oh it was the 70s there you go yeah 70s yeah we didn't actually get rid of so my my family was originally rejected for immigration on the basis of the white Australia policy mm. back in back in the early 70s. Um, but even at the time, um, there was a new government coming in and that was more progressive. And the, the customs official told my father to go away for five years and try again, uh, which is why I, I uh, spent the early years of my life in Africa, um, because my dad took a, a contract in Zambia for five years. Um, and that's why where I learned to speak English, and then we immigrated after that. Mm. Um, so, and and true to his word, five years time, the white Australia policy was gone, and you saw the influx of Asians originally. Um, and um, lately, you know, so this Australia has waves of immigrants. So, uh, initially it was Asians, and then it became um, people from the African uh, continent. Um, and that's what's and and that that's the latest wave of immigrants people people from from Africa, 
Um, but it's uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, I grew up in multicultural Australia, and you have distinct bands of immigration. Mm. So it it started with um, what Emma uh, terms the wogs, um, mm. which was actually a term that was very owned, um, and then the Asians and uh, and now the Africans, and it it just seems to to be a stratification of our society that we're being added to um, yep. with each band of immigration, which is, you know, wonderful. It changes Australia each time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a history of, you know, it was more European. I mean, and obviously, you know, during the dreadful times in Ireland, we had a huge Irish immigrant population and lots of Italians. I mean, there were whole distinct villages really in New York City from that and Los Angeles today has very much, you know, it has Koreatown, this and that. But of course, the whole thing is reignited here. And a big question that I thought was a good one today is, is the problem we're having at the moment, the surge, this is something that the Biden administration has fostered, or in fact, is this the backup from the Trump policies all the way back to, to 2016? I favored the latter because I think everything was bottled up and right. now it's surging forward. It's hard to take the cork out of a bottle slowly. You know? mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I brought it up because I think um, in a matter of historical fiction is really dealing with contemporary problems. I mean, they're in a different context, but uh, when reading Solari's books, the things she writes about are really true today. And uh, Emma, your books are contemporary, but nonetheless have historical roots. So so there we are. I don't I don't like it when people say I never read historical fiction or whatever. And I think, get over it, you know, you're <laughs> you're missing out. Uh, so yeah, I mean a lot a lot of historical fiction is not talking about the past anyway. Uh it, it is, as you say, talking about aspects of today and, and certainly what you describe in terms of your immigration spike. Australia has a a different scenario, which is worse in a way. Um we have a very brutal policy. Uh, for refugees, and the fear is that if we uh, uh, loosen that policy, then we're going to be um, suddenly bombarded with boats, and that that is a that has been used. That fear has been used to keep that um, quite appalling policy in place for a number of years in a in a way that you would not think would last in a progressive country. Um, so that that fear of 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 surges coming in uh, is prevalent in our society as well. It was, you know, back in the seventies, the fear of uh, Vietnamese immigration at the time, and in the end, the decision was made to just let them in, and uh, the result is that nothing bad happened. Uh, we we have a richer society as a result. Um, but for some reason, we don't seem to ever learn that lesson. Uh, every time someone wants to come in, we want to shut the door. Um, and um, we don't seem to learn those lessons from history, which is why there's always fodder for historical fiction writers, I guess. Well, yeah, I think that communities, it's always the last person in wants to shut the door. And particularly yeah. in, you know, both Australia and America were really settled by immigrants. I mean, they had native populations. We won't even discuss how badly they were treated. But nonetheless, we are countries where at least the white population arrived from elsewhere. And I think that, you know, that complicates it. But let's talk about Roland in China, because he is actually a minority in Shanghai. He's gone there. Why is he in Shanghai? Um, he's in Shanghai because he got into so much trouble uh, in Book 8 that uh, he is finding himself physically in danger from people who objected uh, to, to what he did in Book 8, uh, so without spoiling Book 8. Uh, and, and so his, his brother, his weary brother, who is trying to uh, keep Roland alive, um, and out of trouble, sends him to Shanghai, uh, ostensibly to trade wool, but with the specific instruction that he is to do anything but trade wool. He's basically there to hold the family seat at negotiations, um, to be a Sinclair, um, but not to actually do anything because he really can't be trusted to sign anything. Um, and so, he, he is uh, shuffled off to Shanghai and, of course, he's, 
his friends are sent with him um, basically to make sure he goes. Um, and, uh, and of course, Roland being Roland, uh, fate conspires to make his sojourn in, um, in Shanghai anything but calm and restful. It's really too bad that Will even contemplates the fact that this quartet could stay out of trouble because um, we have Roland who has a great deal of family money, thanks in part to Will looking after it, um, and his bohemian group. He has a sculptor uh, whom he loves, but it's a, a complicated relationship and he is a poet and he has an artist. So it's a bohemian kind of a crown. But um, yes. Father in Shanghai, they meet up with some interesting characters. And Shanghai in the 30s was really a melting pot for um, all kinds of things, you know, different, different cultures, different um, communities there. And a lot of, a lot of, well, it's called spying because they were, you know, we're coming up towards the war and there's tremendous yep. amount of ferment. You've got the Japanese threatening, you've got the Germans threatening, you've got the British still there. You know, you've got um, the Chinese government sort of, has, already, has it already been Nanking by the time Shanghai Secrets is written, The Rape of Nanking? Has that already happened? Yes. I think yes. it was so, in so, so that happened in 34, 33, I think. And yes, so, so Manchuria, uh, has happened, and the Japanese have come into to Manchuria with all the the horror of that invasion. Um, but they seem to have come to an agreement. Um, so Shanghai is fine. Shanghai carries on like normal, and it was one of Shanghai was one of those great cities like London and New York and Paris that you know very little stopped it. Um, and parties were still going on. And though the world, everything with tensions were rising all over the world, there was still the Japanese quarter and the German quarter and the French quarter and, and, and Shanghai was carrying on like a treaty port. Um, I, was, I was really interested in reading the background of Shanghai. Um, I have a friend who, who was part of Australia's diplomatic service. Um, and he used to tell me some of the stories about how Australian diplomats would play once they left the country um, because, you know, what went on in such and such a city stayed in such and such a city. So it was almost like when you left the country, all the societal rules by which you abided when you were in the country were suddenly gone. Uh, and Shanghai was very much like that. It had a reputation for being a, an international playground where everybody lived out uh, their wildest, most inappropriate fantasies. Um, and, uh, and so I thought that would be a really interesting, I mean, I, I find it an interesting place myself, but I thought it would be an interesting place to um, throw Roland and his bohemian entourage into a place that was probably more bohemian than they were. Um, <laughs> My only trip to Shanghai was in 1990. It was the year that the Hong Kong transfer was going to happen. So what is that, 99, 97, 99? Yeah. And, yeah. and so Shanghai was not yet fully Chinese and the Bund where the various foreign, um, yeah. com, you know, the commercial people still had their property and there was nothing on that island at all. That island was just... And you know, I, I can't even imagine going back because it's transformed itself into some replica of New York City and Sydney, you know, with high rises and banks and all the rest of it. But I love the way you write about it. So Emma, um, since we can't talk a whole lot about what happens with Frankie without lots of spoilers, let's go back and talk about Resurrection Bay. I mean, you and Stuari have both won the Ned Kelly Award, which is Australia's um, fabulous crime fiction award named for an outlaw named Ned Kelly. Um, and so Larry didn't win it for a Roland Sinclair book. She wrote it, won it for a book called Now Called, after she wrote him. And we'll ask her about another standalone she's going to do. But Resurrection Bay, when, when was it? 2016? Uh, 2015 in Australia, and it was probably 2016 or 17 in the US, I think. So yeah, a few, a few years ago now. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, R Resurrection Bay um, came about, as, as I said, um, from Caleb's character, which is just um, 
percolating in my brain for, for a very, very long time. Just, you know, and, and he was one of those characters that um, I actually didn't want to write because I thought it would be too hard because I'm not deaf, I'm not hard of hearing. Um, and so I, I got a long way into the manuscript and was loving writing it. I, I'd, I'd written a couple of full length manuscripts before I started Resurrection Bay and I think of them as my, my training wheel novels. You know, I was sort of just learning how to write a book. You know? I didn't want them published. I, I mean, and, and like I probably should burn them and burn the hard disk they're on because if they ever came up in real life, I would be not, not happy. Um, but I was writing Resurrection Bay and, and loving it and really getting into it and, and loving Caleb's character. But I had this moment of absolute sheer terror, um, both because uh, there, there, are, there are dangers of writing outside your lived experiences uh, and you should be cautious because um, you can hurt people and you can misrepresent people and you can also take um, space and attention away from people in that, um, in, in that community who may not have a voice or as much of a voice. But also there's the technical side of how do you write a deaf character? Um, I love dialogue. In fact, my first, my early drafts are, are almost like uh, film scripts. It's all about dialogue. It's how I get to know the characters. If I don't know what's happening next, instead of the old, um, you know, ha have a man walk into the room with a gun, I'll, I'll actually just get my characters talking and one of them will say something shocking eventually and I go, oh, thank you. And that's the direction I go in. So I put the manuscript away for ages, but both Caleb's character and the opening scene I just could not let go of so uh, Resurrection Bay opens and there's no spoiler in this at all because it's the first sentence it, it opens with Caleb holding his uh, best mate's body in his arms his mate has been killed there's blood everywhere he's sitting in a suburban kitchen and I really wanted to know what happened next uh, I wanted to know um, had Caleb killed him you know, he seemed like a decent bloke, but maybe maybe he'd killed him. Um, had had his best mate been up to something? Um, was he a good bloke? Was he into dodgy things? So, I, I after six months, I I thought, well, I can't bear not happening, knowing what happens next. Um, so let's let's just keep writing and 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 see. Um, and that's of course when I I started you know, a huge amount of research and and went off to learn Australian sign language and, and went down a huge rabbit hole of, of research and you know, lived experiences. Um, so yeah, really Resurrection Bay came about because um, I can't bear not knowing things. If I want something, if I want to know the answer to something, I just cannot bear not finding out or at least exhausting all opportunities. Uh, and unfortunately, no one else was going to write the book for me. So I had to do it. <laughs> So the point of view character, who is your point of view character? Because it's difficult to have dialogue if, if the character is deaf. Um, I mean, I assume that's why you learn sign, sign language. What yeah, is it well, called, Auslan, Australian Sign Language? Yeah, Auslan, yeah. Um, that was one of the, sometimes the, the hardest thing in writing actually ends up being an absolute gift to the book or to you as a writer. And that's definitely true of writing a deaf character. So all the things that I thought were going to be really hard actually made the book better. So uh, dialogue was, for example, um, I was worried that I couldn't have much dialogue in it, but in the end, Caleb has to be able to be independent. He can't have an interpreter with him. That means he has to be able to lip read. Lip reading is actually really hard. I've, I've learnt to lip read. I'm extraordinarily bad at it. Um, most people, everyone lip reads to a certain degree. If you're in a noisy room and, and you know, you're looking at, at, at someone and trying to work out what they're saying and suddenly the lights get dim and you can't understand people. So you, you, that's lip reading, you, you're doing it all the time. But obviously once you learn, lose your volume, um, you lose a lot more of the words. So I realized that Caleb was going to miss important information in the books. So once I realised that that was actually a gift as a crime writer, um, I could really le lean into it. Caleb doesn't know if he's missing important information sometimes. So the reader doesn't know if he's missing important information. He can also have someone sneaking up behind him. He can have somebody tell him something that he misinterprets. 
or suspects that he misinterprets. So you've got all that, all those layers of things um, that, although they're difficult as a writer, are actually gift to the book. The sign language was a little bit of a different um, side. I wasn't quite sure if he was going to use sign language uh, at all. Um, most deaf people don't use sign language. Um, there, there is a very strong deaf community, um, but that's a, a very... Uh, it's, it's a discrete community and that um, culturally you're deaf, you use sign language um, and there is a, a great pride and connectivity. But the majority of people who are deaf aren't born into a deaf family, so they have to find their way there. Which actually, Darkness for Light, I really explore Caleb and the deaf community and coming into that. So sign language became a way of showing Caleb at ease in his life. And it also showed a way of um, people being close to him. So the people in his life who love him at least attempt to sign. So we have his ex-wife who's fluent and we also have his business partner Frankie who is a terrible, terrible signer um, but she tries and her signing is also often unintentionally quite crude and quite a few of her experiences are actually my experiences of accidentally saying, signing things I don't intend <laughs> as a new student because you know people sometimes tease you when you're learning a new language and teach you words and signs that perhaps don't mean what they say they mean and you unintentionally may sign things that aren't good for polite society. So I learned quite a lot of those things and, and very conveniently was able to put them into Frankie's hands uh, along the way. So um, it, was, it, was a great, uh, it was a great journey of exploring all these things and it's a continual journey as, as I continue to learn. So in terms of Caleb listening to, well, being signed so he can take in information, many people who are deaf have trouble speaking intelligibly. Is that a problem for Caleb? Well, I decided quite early on that, first of all, he would have to be a skilled lip reader and he would have to be a skilled speaker. Um, he, it, it makes sense for his personality too. He's extremely um, determined as stubborn to the extent that it is bad for him and the people around him. Uh, so it very much makes sense. And from his family history, his relationship with his father, that he would be absolutely determined to, as his ex-wife accuses him, pass. He wants to pass as normal. Um, and, and this is not a healthy thing for him, but he's put a great deal of time and effort into being able to live in the hearing world. He's also post-lingually deaf, which means he learned to speak as a hearing child, became deaf as a young child through meningitis. So that's a really common experience. And funnily enough, since writing the books, I've met many people and also found out many people I already knew uh, are actually deaf to a different <coughs> because it's a spectrum. Um, people I had no idea. Deaf were hearing aids um, and I hadn't actually realised that they were until they told me. So it, it's a really interesting uh, spectrum of experiences. I can imagine there's tremendous, <clears throat> excuse me, progress in miniaturizing hearing aids and so forth here in the United States. In fact, it can be a predatory kind of, a, of an industry. But um, yeah, and the, the wisdom that I have heard, although I'm currently ignoring it, <clears throat> excuse me, is that when you get to be 80, you really ought to take on hearing aids because your brain will not adjust as you get older. And if you wait too long, you never really will adapt to hearing aids. So my husband, who's younger than I am, has hearing aids and won't wear them. My son-in-law has hearing aids and rarely wears them. I don't have any, but I'm old enough that maybe I should. So I, it, it's, a, it's, a difficult, um, it's a difficult thing apparently for people to accept and acknowledge um, but as you say, you can also bluff your way through it if you are able to adapt to the increasing miniaturization, recharging, you don't have to change batteries. That defeated my mother who, who really needed hearing aids in the last years of her life. She was 94 when she died and she wasn't able to deal with changing batteries and so forth. It was too hard for her because her sight wasn't good, her hands didn't work like they should and you know all that. So she ended up 
being so isolated because she couldn't communicate. And it seems to me that is the primary difficulty that deaf people have is that lack of two-way communication or sometimes any communication. That's exactly, and that was one of the, the joys of Darkness for Light is um, I have Resurrection Bay where there's trauma and Fire Came Down, which is about the aftermath of trauma. And Darkness for Light is Caleb finding his way into a better space. He starts off, he's, he's trying, he's using therapy, he's reconnecting with the deaf community. And the deaf community is easy for him because you get the two-way communi communication. Everyone signs and there's no effort involved. But of course, then you have to explore the darker side of that where everyone knows all your secrets. So, so in, Sh in Shanghai Secrets to Larry, um, assuming that we don't have native Chinese speakers in, um, in Roland's party, um, there's a communication issue going on there and that they, they're going to need interpreters, not just for the Chinese, but the Russian and whatever else comes along. Yes. So uh, Shanghai was such a multilingual place because it had all the quarters. Uh, people speaking French and Russian and German and, um, and Shanghainese, which is different again. Um, and of course, the, the different parties communicated through pidgin. And pigeon is a really awkward thing to write because yeah. it sounds like um, those, you know, those terrible depictions of Chinese people in those in old movies, which made them, uh, which made them sound infantile. Uh, but pigeon, you know, this when you do a little bit more research, was uh, not about badly spoken English. It was because at the time, many Chinese didn't think English worthy of learning. And so they just uh, used pidgin as a method of communicating when they had to um, with the English barbarians and, and then they maintained their own society. Um, so what funnily has been used in you know, old movies and and Western media to uh, make it seem as though Chinese people were lesser uh, was actually an indication of how they felt they were better. <laughs> um, and so it was, it, it, it's really intriguing, it's, and, but it's a horrible thing to write because it does, uh, it does sound disrespectful when you write it. But the fact is it was, and you know, people who, uh, uh, were touring in Shanghai, were given little books on uh, how to translate things into uh, into pigeon so that they could communicate with people, you know, things like chop chop, which you really, you know, when I didn't really think it was a real thing, I thought it was something that came out of cartoons, uh, but in fact it was. So it's, it, uh, and uh, so that was, that was interesting. Roland speaks a lot of languages, but he doesn't speak any Asian languages. And part of the, my reasoning for going to Shanghai or why um, part of the reason I wanted Roland in Shanghai is I realized that I had written eight books and the eight books are really discussions of how we got to a place, to the place that we did in World War II. Um, and I realized that I had addressed that by looking west the whole time. And there was another half of the world where things were going on. Um, and I hadn't actually considered that. And I hadn't looked at what was going on in the east. I hadn't looked at, you know, tensions rising with the militarization of Japan and, and their expansion. Um, I, I hadn't looked at what the, what the Germans were doing in the east as well, as well as Americans and all the other countries. And I, and, and I hadn't actually looked at how trade was being used as a weapon, which it still is today. Um, so I thought that Shanghai would be a great way of forcing Roland's eyes to the east yeah. and having him look um, look at it from a different perspective and maybe address why he feels the way he does about things. Now, I mentioned before that he has this sense of urgency about what's going on in Europe and what uh, the Germans, are, what the Nazis are doing uh, to basically disenfranchise uh, socialists and Jews um, and anybody who disagrees with them. 
Uh, but the question that was always ticking over for me is why did he care about that so much when in his own country, the Aboriginal people are completely disenfranchised? Um, and certainly, you know, when you look at America, um, it had its own problems uh, with people being not so much legally disenfranchised, but socially disenfranchised. Um, and one of the things that intrigues me about when I write is the overriding question of what makes you stand for one thing and not another? Or do you just stand for one thing? Uh, what makes one thing your fight? Um, and I don't know that I ever answer it in this book. I don't know that there is an answer, uh, but I wanted to put the question to Roland. And certainly in this book, uh, Wing Zhao, who is a, a, a Chinese a man who speaks languages and acts as an interpreter for Roland, but who has experienced the, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria, puts that question to Roland. Um, and uh, I just wanted to see what he thought. I'm not sure that he actually answered coherently, but uh, I just wanted him to think about it. Well, it's an exciting story and actually has humor in it for anybody who thinks this is a really dark and intense book. I mean, all of the Roland Sinclair's about bad things happen have a lot of humor. Some of it's situational, some of it just the way the characters interact. But I, would, I was thinking for both of you, you know, one, one of the things that we haven't quite mentioned and it came up for me when we had a famous Swedish author come to the Poison Pen to uh, do a program. And he obviously had learned enough English, you know, some English, and he had an interpreter with him. And, and we did the program, but I could see that it was quite a strain for him. And afterward, as, as you both know, it's our usual policy, you know, to socialize, you know, have an after party and and all, and you know, and I thought about that. I, I offered them a ride back to their very posh hotel here in Scottsdale. And I really thought about, you know, should I keep up our tradition and, you know, offer them drinks and offer them food and all. And then I thought to myself, they're exhausted. They are exhausted mm -hmm. trying to talk to me in English. I don't have any Swedish, so that was never gonna go. And the kind thing to do would be to leave them, you know, to, to retreat to their own language and, relax. And, you know, I think that that would be true of Roland and his friends in Shanghai when they just want to hang out together. It would be true of Caleb, you know, um, in his world. And I don't know that we really appreciate how exhausting it is to be navigating a world in which we cannot fully communicate. Yeah, you know? it's something I was, I was, I, I think, um, aware of empathically, you know, how you get into a character's brain. But it wasn't actually until I physically put, you know, foam earbuds in my ears and went out into the world and tried to go about my shopping and catch buses and talk to people and order coffees and get the wrong order in cafes while trying to lip read that I realised how deeply exhausting it is mm -hmm. to always be doing that. And this is, and I've lived in other countries where I haven't spoken the language and have had to learn the language. And I, so I knew how tiring it was, but to be, I also knew it was for, you know, it's only for a year or it's only for two years. This is your entire life that you're doing it. And I think you're right, that, that deep sense of exhaustion and also why people like Caleb will just then stand back. I don't need to be part of this world because I'm not quite part of it. Um, so this is where, you know, the, the, the lone gumshoe, the lone detective, you know, really, really comes into his own or her own is if you can get that sense of, that's oh, just too much, back off. Well, I think it's easy to be deceived in situations like that where you don't fully, you certainly don't get all the nuance. You don't necessarily grasp everything that's been said and your impulse is, is almost in some ways to turn inward. So, you know, I, I think it works very well in Shanghai Secrets, uh, Sulari, for you to do that. Oh well, yeah, look, I think um, also sometimes, though, not being able to understand the spoken word um, allows you to understand other things. Um, so you're, I, I, I have memories of being thrown into school with no English. 
mm-hmm. which is the way it was done in those days. You uh, you had children and you wanted them to learn a language, you just sent them to school. Um, and I remember being in a school where nobody understood me except my sister. But I also remember watching people. Mm-hmm. And I think probably, I mean, it may be that my habit of watching people came out of those few weeks when nobody understood a word I said uh, because your only way of understanding what people were wanting to do whether they were hostile whether they were friendly is to pay very close attention to their body language Um, and I think you know that's always what I was trying to do with Roland because he's an artist he's an observer first so he watches people just naturally um, because he's all of course, thinking about it in an artistic sense and composition, how he paint them. But it allows him to um, get nuance uh, that he would miss if he was just listening to what they said. Um, because quite often um, deceptive, you know, if someone's being deceptive, it's uh, they, they're primarily deceptive through their words uh, and they're not so much in control of their face and their body language. Um, and their actions um, but I but I do understand what uh, what Emma's saying in terms of the uh, the exhaustion of mm. of having to communicate it is a really um, it is it, I mean even on a minor on a minor level when you go to a party where you don't know anyone it's exhausting at the end of it because you're trying to be a part of conversations and trying to um, make links so that's in a very minor scale that maybe everybody can understand then language is a is a different uh, level where you don't have an, a clue what anybody's saying but then everybody knows that you don't understand the language so they're trying to help you deafness is another level again uh, where it can sometimes be hidden and and people don't actually understand enough to to assist you and in fact you know, do things like mumble or talk from behind a newspaper um, inadvertently because they don't understand um, that they're excluding you by doing that. I like your your thing about the observation is absolutely true, though, because that, that was one of those gifts that was given to me by writing Caleb's character because I'm not at all visual, I'm, I'm oral. And um, because he had to be picking up on those body language clues. So it's a real gift for him but it's actually made me a much more observant writer, um, a slightly more observant person. Like I do occasionally remember where I've been and where I'm going and maybe what someone looks like, you know. It's, it's still a bit of a challenge, but it's, it's made him a lot more observant, definitely. Well, there's a lot more science that's been developed about how to read people's facial and other signals and determine whether they're lying or, you know, being deceitful or what kind of emotional state they're in and so forth. So, uh, yeah, and I think, Sulari, you're right, that you know, writers are observational by nature. Um, you know, you're, you're making stuff up, but at the same time, you have to, it has to spring from somewhere, some well. And so you have to create that. Um, Patrick, you're hiding back there in your black screen, but maybe you should come out and see if you have questions or comments that you would like to put forth. Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Not too many questions, but um, uh, Victoria has a question for you, Emma, which is, uh, do you have any plans to take Caleb out of Australia for a future novel? Oh, that is such an interesting question. Maybe <laughs> is, is the answer to that. I, it, I'm always exploring different ideas um, of situations I can put him into and um, what is interesting Uh, and I definitely wanted this series to be not just in Australia but in this very specific area of Australia in the south in the uh, you know the southeastern corner Um, because every area is quite different it's like the United States in that um, all the states are quite different Uh, they have different topography and different people So taking him to a different country is something that I have thought could be really, really interesting. But I would have to come up with a really good reason why. And then we have another layer of him not being able to understand as well. Because once you get accents into it, it's even harder. And sign language is not universal. So he would not have 
sign language to fall back on, which could be a gift for the book. So the long answer to that is that. The short answer is maybe. That is so interesting. I hadn't thought about sign language not being universal, but of course it no. isn't. Uh, not language would change. So yeah, you would be back to ground zero if you landed in Russia or somewhere and there you were. I'm sure there are, I'm sure there are regional, you know, regional slang yes. uh, in sign language. Yeah, you have to be quite careful. E even Australia, which is relatively universal sign language, there, there are like, so the, the, the sign for thirsty in the southern states where I am is actually the sign for horny in the northern states. Um, and you only find that out when you've signed the wrong thing. So yeah, you could be, there's definitely slang involved. <laughs> yes, I can see if you said I am, it could go very badly. <laughs> <laughs> and how that went. Speaking of other countries, um, Sulari, um, this is the ninth Roland Sinclair and we are in Shanghai, but it's a springboard to the 10th Roland Sinclair, which takes the whole group to Boston in a book called Where There's a Will, or at least I think it's still called Where There's a Will. <laughs> Yes, it is. It is cool where there's a will. I haven't actually seen it printed yet, so I suppose it could still change, but it is called where there's a will as far as I know. So it's really intriguing, you know, Australia to Shanghai to Boston. And one of the reasons the Roland Sinclair has worked so well is that air travel is is a part of them. They've been able, because Australia is a long way to it other places. And so, so far, our, our heroes have been to Germany, England. They've been on a transatlantic liner to the United States. Um, now they're in Shanghai. Then they're going to go to Boston. And then the end of book 10, even I don't know what's going to happen next. Do you, Shulari? Um, I think uh, Roland's going to go home for a while um, to, to Australia um, because there's things going on there. And he just, he does need to come home occasionally because he has a dog. And uh, I'm I'm a dog owner, and when he's overseas, I worry about Lennon and how Lennon is doing with Roland away. Um, so I I do make him go home every now and then, and spend some time with his dog. Um, but uh, yeah, so I I, I think uh, he will reset in um, uh, in Australia, but he's also actually keen to come back to America. So what, what has happened for him in Australia is that he can't really exhibit uh, in Australia anymore because he's uh, been branded um, as, a, as a communist sympathizer and an insurgent, but America doesn't know him. So America is uh, a whole new place for him to go and where he can actually be an artist and, and exhibit, which is what he, what, what he is fundamentally. Um, so we'll see see what goes on. I'm, I'm in 1936, so there's a there's a lot happening. I don't plot; I just throw Roland on the page and see what happens. But I am aware that in 1936 we're seeing the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, uh, the Berlin Olympics. So there's a lot of um, a lot of things happening around the world which may pull him in one direction or another. It was an incredibly tumultuous decade, no question. I mean, just one major thing after another. Patrick, anything else? Um, well, I just have a quick question for both of you regarding, you know, who are some of your your influences as as writers? Uh, w w were there, you know, Australian crime novelists that you really looked to for inspiration? And as a as a corollary to that, you know, we we all know about, you know, Arthur Upfield. Um, he's one of the famous. Uh, Australian crime novelist. How is how is he viewed there now? Has it, have his books aged well? No, uh, Arthur Upfield <laughs> so. is, is, is really considered a little bit of a relic, don't you think, Emma? Yeah, he's he's yeah. you know he's part of our literary history, um, yeah. but uh, we're we're very aware that a lot of his opinions and his views and the way that he wrote. Uh, is certainly not something that Australian society would accept today. But he's very popular in France and Germany, I hear. It was interesting. I actually hadn't heard his name for possibly decades and, until we went to the United States. I think most readers here probably aren't even aware of him unless they're older readers here. Um, I don't even know if his books are still in print in Australia, I'd say. Uh, well, there, there was a... There was a movie about yes. murder 
that featured Arthur Upfield, which is why I uh, became aware of him. And of course, I knew about the Boney series. Yes, yeah. Um, which, so, uh, it is interesting how, how things have, have changed o over the years of, of what, what is uh, acceptable in writing and, 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 and what is right at, at the time of, of, of an era. Um, in, in terms of influences, I mean, there's a huge body of uh, great Australian crime writing. Um, and it, it, sometimes it's hard to spot your own influences. Um, but I, I mean, I think I've probably been influenced by every single book I've read. Uh, be it crime or literary or, or whatever you want to call it. Um, and it, as much as I can spot influences, I think if I went back to my teenage years when I was reading John le Carre and, and people like that obviously made a huge impact, but, it, but equally like Jane Austen or, you know, Stephen King or someone, um, in terms of Australian crime writers, you've got Peter Corris going back to that real that first real um, urban Sydney style of writing um, and, and Peter Temple um, and, and then contemporary, you've got um, great writers like Mala Nunn um, and, oh God, I'm going to think of a whole, <laughs> forget a whole slew of names now, but um, even just looking at the, the, the long lists and the short lists of the David Awards, which is our Sisters in Crime Awards and the Ned Kelly Awards, you see this great slew of Australian crime writers that yeah we're coming that are coming through now but are also back the last 20 30 years Dorothy Porter is a huge one that no one's ever heard of outside of Australia um, she's a brilliant writer she wrote um, a couple of crime novels in verse um, the most famous one would be The Monkey's Mask which is a fantastic it's like a standard gumshoe um, investigator but um, she's a lesbian investigator and um, it's this very short novel in verse of an investigation. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. What's it called again? The Monkey's Mask by Dorothy Porter. And very it's, fun. It's, a fun, fun here. It's, it, this, it's interesting in, term of, in terms of influences. There's the influences you had until you wrote your first book. Mm. And then once you write your first book, you become part of the writing community and it's an ongoing cycle of influences. Mm. Um, so... I was, you know, I was very steeped in Agatha Christie, to tell you the truth. I wasn't really into the Australian crime writing scene when I wrote my first book. Um, and I, I wasn't really actually into the a, a, a vast crime novel reader. I was, um, I, I read widely, but I wouldn't have said that um, crime was my genre of choice until I wrote a crime novel. And then I discovered this richness of Australian crime. Um, since then, you know, uh, uh, people who have sort of gone the past, like Morel Day, for example, with the Harry Lavender series, which was, um, which really set new standards in Australia at the time. And then, of course, the, the names that Emma's already mentioned, Marla Nunn, Pam Newton, um, there's Angela Savage. Um, there's the, Terry Greenwood and Jane Harper. And Candace in her right. earlier books. Of course, and then, and then interestingly, and you've got Michael Robotham, who lives in Australia now, but his books are still set in England. And Barry Maitland might have moved into Australia as the standing, but wrote a wonderful London policing yeah. series. So, you yeah, know, it's, sure. a, it's a complicated, yeah. uh, but that's true of American crime fiction too. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, there's a, it's it's I, I see what Emma means in that it's hard to pinpoint your influences because you're constantly being influenced, mm -hmm. uh, and every person you read and every person you meet influences you. And sometimes you haven't even read their novel, but they influence you in their attitudes and their discussions and their conversations, uh, the way that they value the craft, um, and their insight into the craft. Um, so we. You know, well, one of the great benefits of being a published crime writer is that you suddenly have access um, to this wonderful school um, of just being around other crime writers and learning from them without actually even trying. Good point. Patrick, anything else? Uh, that's about it, really. Oh, anything you guys would like to ask each other? Emma, do you have a penetrating question for Sulari and vice versa? 
Yeah, so, so Solari, <laughs> is your next one a standalone or is it another Roly? Uh, the next one that's coming out is a standalone. Um, it, it's actually called The Woman in the Library now. Um, it was, in fact, a book that I wrote for Barbara uh, when she was my primary editor. Um, so that'll come out in May. Um, and then um, hopefully it'll be Roly 11, uh, which will be the next one out then. So America's basically catching up. Um, where there's a will will be out in January in America. And then um, things will move on. Uh, is, that yeah. a, is, that a, is that a contemporary, The Woman in the Library? Yes, it is. It is. And, you know, when I wrote After She Wrote Him, I never thought I'd ever write another contemporary book. Uh, but I had such a lovely experience working with Barbara on Crossing the Lines as it was then that it almost it gave me the courage to write a contemporary book. I used to say to people, I'm not a contemporary person. I can't write a contemporary book. I don't know how people nowadays think. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, um, I, I think people forget that even after you've had a number of books published, it can, it, this is a really insecure profession. And I know for myself, I'm always trying to justify my existence in it. And I'm always very tentative when I step outside my field. So I've established in historical fiction. And after she wrote him was just an idea that I had that had to be written. And so it was written. Uh, but I never really expected anyone to pick it up. And I never really expected uh, for it to really speak to people the way it has. And I never really expected it to be such a joy to work with an editor on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I, I stepped into contemporary fiction for a second time, which is why the second book is Barbara's in my mind, um, because it's it's a similar sort of step into into contemporary, but also looking at writing um, and the minds of writers, which has now become uh, a secondary interest outside the, you know, uh, what led to World War II uh, for me. It was a real joy to work with you on after she wrote it and to see how it evolved. And it's a very complicated story. And it's also, it's, it's almost always true with really complicated stories. The hard part is to bring it all together in the end game. It's easy to start it. It's easy to throw those things out there and follow them. But to bring it together in a successful resolution is a real challenge. And Solari is a joy to work with because whatever suggestion you make to her, whether she agrees with it or not, she considers it. Um, so it's a very collaborative process. And, um, and we did the same thing with... Is it the woman in the library? Not the girl. Okay. Yeah, the woman the library, in the library. We went back and forth a lot um, on it. And there's some um, epistolary material in it, which um, is another interesting way to tell a story. So it was it was great. I hope we can keep this up, Kim. You know, I really enjoy working with your contemporaries and the Rollins. So we'll carry on. Emma, um, you've already mentioned that you had another book coming. So Larry, what would you ask Emma? I would ask you about this other book. We, we did speak when we were wandering around America about what other than Caleb you may be thinking about. Mm. What other than Caleb are you yeah. thinking about? So I'm, I'm, I'm just about to dive into the edits of Caleb 4. Um, and at the same time, it's quite a weird headspace to be in, actually, because I haven't been in this headspace before because I've been writing a series as I'm writing the current book and, and as I'm editing, I am thinking about the next book in the series, but it is the same world. It is the same characters with, with outside characters coming in, but it is, it, it's, a, it's a universe I know extremely well. At the moment, I'm deeply thinking about Caleb 4 because I'm diving into the edits and I'm thinking about this next book. And so I've got two two worlds in my brain at the moment, or three, I guess, because it's the world I'm actually living in, but I don't pay much attention to that, so that's fine. So I've got, I've got Kayla Four and I've got uh, a standalone, and there's about three standalone novels that I want to write next. But the one I'm almost certain I'm going to write is, I'm um, doing an anti-Solari, is actually a historical novel. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's actually a little bit inspired by some family history, but it's going to be a Between the Wars novel um, and it's, it's very much calling to me. Um, and, and it just, as you say, the, the, the contemporary novels draw on the past so much and yep. the historical novels are looking towards the future. So, yeah, uh, I think um, this is so, yeah, I've got a couple of characters there who are just like going, knocking on the door, saying, start writing. So, so we'll... Um, 20s and 30s, or 20s yeah. or 30s? 30s, 30s, 30s. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a really hot era to write about, and here we are living through it again. So I think it yeah. probably inspires us to think about it. You know, one of the great joys of Zoom, assuming there are any, but there really are, is the opportunity to talk to you because the odds that we could have done this together in Scottsdale uh, were, were not terrific. Um, and Patrick and I have both commented about how wonderful it is that we can assemble people from different locations and still have wonderful conversations. So it's really been a pleasure, ladies. Thank you so much for getting up early, brewing your coffee. It's actually the next day in Australia. It's Thursday morning there, and it's Wednesday yeah. afternoon here. So Larry found out the hard way because she tried to sign in yesterday. Forget her. <laughs> but anyway. I was wondering where everybody was. I thought, oh, my goodness. <laughs> I was practically sending tweets to Emma and Barbara, <laughs> saying, where are you? <laughs> And where yeah. we were was the wrong day, right? But it all worked out. Anyway, enjoy the rest of your day, ladies. Um, it's been lovely to talk to you. Patrick, thank you as ever for your terrific hosting. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.